So today we're going to talk about the block equations and the big change today is we're going to introduce finally this concept uh, both mathematically and try to give you some intuition for this idea about relaxation. Um, in the background of this slide you'll see a figure two from a patent application from gosh it must be the late 60s or something like that maybe early 70s. Really interesting story a guy named Ray Damadian was one of the first uh, sort of inventors of sorts or researchers perhaps in the field of magnetic resonance as it was becoming an imaging science. So it wasn't an imaging science immediately, right? People were doing spectroscopy and really boring things for a long, long time, right? And then they started doing imaging. Um, and this was his conceptualization for an MR imaging device, right? Terrifying, right? Can you imagine like you know, dropping a patient in head, you know, feet first into this chamber and then taking really blurry pictures of their anatomy. Um, things turned out okay for him in 2003. Uh, well, the short story is in 2003, the Nobel Prize was awarded for physiology and medicine and it went to Mansfield, a guy from the UK, and uh, Lauterberg, a guy from the US. Uh, and Lauter, uh, sorry, and uh, Demadian, whose patent we're looking at, was left off of that award. Uh, and was not named as, uh, as having made a significant contribution to the invention of imaging per se. And so there's a bit of controversy as to whether or not he belonged on that uh, Nobel Prize or not. Uh, at the end of the day, Ray Damadian is fine. Uh, he ended up suing various uh, imaging companies for <laughs> huge amounts of money and you know, won at least one $100 million lawsuit from a single manufacturer. Uh, so I'm sure he would like a Nobel Prize, but he's comfortable. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, so what we didn't get a chance to uh, quite finish last time was the last lecture. So I'm going to go through sort of the tail end of those slides. They're still in your packet here, so you don't need the previous packet. And we'll get going with that information. Um, these are the learning objectives from last time. So hopefully now you have an understanding of the differences between spin, precession, and nutation. Nutation was kind of newly introduced last time, right? Nutation was what? I heard flip angle, right? So we're going to talk more about flip angles today, but if the bulk magnetization points straight up, we can force it over with a B1 pulse, and the, the amount we force it over is according to the flip angle, and that process of rotating away from the z-axis we call nutation. Um, and so it's important to appreciate that really any B field acts on the spin system. You'll see this in your homework assignment, which is available on the web. We can talk about maybe at the end of class or at the break or something if we need to. Uh, but any B field, of course, acts on the spin system, the B0 field, the B1 field, and they'll just superpose to have action on the underlying spin system. And you'll get maybe some more insight to that in the homework assignment. Uh, we talked a bit about circularly polarized RF fields and compared them to linearly polarized fields. What was the main advantage of being cir circularly polarized? Lower SAR, right? So less patient heating. So if we want to do the same things, we want to tip the spins over by 10 degrees, we can do that with less energy if we use a circularly polarized field. And then we did it rather quickly, but we uh, started to move from the laboratory frame into the rotating frame. And mathematically, there is a sort of very formal way to do that, but uh, it's a bit dry, uh, albeit important. Um, and so we sort of adopted the rotating frame, and we effectively leave the laboratory frame behind at this point. We get in with the spin system and rotate it, the Larmor frequency, with the spin system. And that makes it easier mathematically and sort of just conceptually to observe and understand what the spin system is doing. Um, we didn't really quite get to these last two things, and so that's what we're going to finish doing at the first part of this lecture, and then we'll come back to these. How can we actually compute the flip angle if we know something about the envelope function? We saw a little bit of that at the, at the very end of the uh, working on the board last time. Uh, and then we want to understand how to apply an RF hard pulse matrix operator. And what we're going to do at the very end of this lecture is I'm going to give you some, uh, we'll probably spend 20 minutes or so going over some MATLAB uh, kind of tips and tricks as to how we can actually use MATLAB in a really convenient way to act on spin systems. Uh, and that'll be helpful for your homework assignment and I think maybe conceptually give you uh, some hands on for how to, how to work with some of this stuff. Okay? Okay. So let's talk first about the mathematics of uh, RF pulses. Uh, the idea is that an RF pulse can in principle be described by at least two different parameters. Now, if you know anything about RF pulses, this is in some sense going to be a simplification. We're not really going to talk too much about uh, how we formulate a particular envelope function, for example. But for any RF pulse, we can typically talk 
uh, at least in general terms, about the flip angle of the RF pulse and also the phase of the RF pulse. Uh, remember that B fields induce left-hand rotations. We're not used to thinking of things being left-handed, right? Uh, but uh, B field acting on a, positive, on, a, on a species with a positive gyromagnetic ratio will induce a left-handed rotation. So keep that in mind. Uh, and RF pulses also have a phase associated with them, and I'll talk about what this means in a second. But uh, as I said before, the flip angle is how far you tip away from the z-axis, and the phase is which direction do you tip, right? You could conceivably tip down in you know, lots of different ways to get into the transverse uh, plane. So we talk about the flip angle and the phase. And when I, in this class, when we talk about writing down sort of some operator for the RF pulse, We'll write it as RF subscript theta superscript alpha, and the theta will tell us about the phase of the RF pulse, and the alpha will tell, tell us about the flip angle or the amplitude. Sahid? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, to be honest, in a lot of circumstances, it's, it's not very important, right? So for a lot of applications, we don't really care too much. Uh, that being said, there are also some very interesting applications where we care, where we care about, uh, say, phase differences. And so we maybe have to be very careful about controlling the phase for some experiments and then controlling it in a slightly different way for other experiments. Um, there are actually a lot of things you can do with the phase. We won't, as a function of time, be able to get into them too much in this class. They're important for spoiling, so we can change the phase to manipulate the state of the transverse magnetization uh, uh, would be one example at least. Uh, what we'll talk about today is really just the mathematics of what's happening. And so in this diagram here, you'll see it several times today, but we can talk about the flip angle tipping away from the z-axis, and we can talk about a phase angle, uh, theta, which tells us, you know, it actually d describes, uh, uh, helps us describe the axis upon which we will be uh, um, rotating about. The axis we rotate about is described by theta. I'll give you some concrete examples. So we'll talk first about the flip angle. Um, so it's, again, and just coming from the book, it's the amount of rotation of the bulk magnetization vector produced by an RF pulse with respect to the direction of the static magnetic field. And so again, we can see it described here as being an angle alpha. Uh, the rate or the frequency at which you're going to uh, nutate is going to be governed by the amplitude of B1, right? Any field acts on the spin system. Uh, the big difference between B1 and B0 is their directionality. Right, and their amplitude, right? B0 is very, very, very strong and points only along Z. B1 is very, very, very weak and points somewhere in the transverse plane, right? It's rotating, in fact, as a function of time. So we can, in fact, talk about uh, a sort of a, a alarmer relationship uh, as, a, as, uh, as a consequence of the applied B1 field as well. And we saw this when we were looking at what spins were doing in the laboratory frame before where they would be precessing around because of the B0 field, but then spiraling downwards as a function of the applied B1 field. And the frequency at which they're rotating downward, right, angles per unit time, uh, is just described again through the Larmor relationship. Um, when we, we can talk about sort of rules for uh, RF pulses, and I said before that when in this class we'll subscript the theta for the phase and we'll superscript alpha as the flip angle just as a shorthand notation. Um, and so it also is important to understand what is a zero degree phase versus say a 90 degree phase. So these two RF pulse operators here, they both have the same flip angle, 90 degrees and 90 degrees, but they have different phases, zero degrees and 90 degrees. So take as the initial condition that your bulk magnetization points along the z-axis. And now we have to use our left hand, right, for the left hand rule for what a B1 field does to a spin system. And so uh, by definition, zero degrees means your thumb points along x, okay? That is the zero degrees phase axis, if you will. And the B1 field is going to curl around your thumb now. And so that means if it's a 90 degree pulse and my thumb's along X, the left-handed rotation brings the magnetization down along the Y axis. Good? So then, the, then following up on that, uh, this example here should hopefully make sense. I have to take my left hand, I would point it along X to begin with, but now I say, oh wait, hang on, my phase is 90 degrees. So I have to rotate 90 degrees so my thumb's pointing along Y. And now when I curl according to the left-hand rule, my bulk magnetization falls down along minus x. Okay, so, so two simple examples of how we change the phase, uh, which will dictate where does the transverse magnetization end up at some, at the end of that RF pulse, say, 
Now, how important that is, it, it depends on the application, but I want you to understand the mathematics of it first, and then it'll come up from time to time what we need to do with that or why it's a useful thing. Johan? Omega 1 is the frequency of mutation, correct. Yeah, so it's actually not the omega 2, it's the delta omega. Oh, that's it. Yeah, I didn't mean to say it that way. That's exactly so right. Yeah, you have your omegas as well. Yep. So it's everything from 2 to omega 2 up to omega. Right. Yeah. So he's just pointing out that omega 1 is the frequency of mutation. If I said precession, it was kind of by accident. It's a good catch. Okay. Uh, so how do we t determine the actual flip angle? We just began to see this. We'll come back to this in a second when I work on the board again. Uh, but when we work through the, uh, the block equations and the rotating frame uh, for forced precession, which was what we were doing at the end of class, we ended up with you know, some sine and cosine terms that depended on the integral of the B1 envelope function. And that effectively defines the flip angle itself. And so if, if we have some B1 envelope function, in this case, maybe it's just a rect function, right? So the B1 field is turned on for some duration, tau, and then it's turned off. If we just integrate that function over time for its uh, duration, that will, and then multiply by gamma, we'll effectively end up with the flip angle for that pulse. And that should make sense. You just have some frequency of mutation. And if you integrate over a function of time, you'll be adding up how far it's gone. And so when you add up how far it's gone, that gives you the flip angle. Um, so we have an expression. Maybe we're using an RF pulse that's a box function, nice and simple. Uh, and so um, in general, when it comes to, say, designing your own MR sequence, we usually have an alpha that's our target. We need to hit a particular flip angle, right? That experiment requires that we start with a 90-degree pulse or some other optimization has shown us that it needs to be 62 degrees, right? Uh, in general, once we specify the alpha, we would operate at or near the maximum B1 that our scanner could produce. Uh, they don't generate really high B1s. Do you remember kind of order of magnitude? Microtesla, and sort of like maybe tens of microtesla. And so we know what our alpha needs to be. We know what our system can achieve. Uh, and basically, we, we typically want the shortest duration pulse. It's not always true, but that's a way of helping you get some insight to designing an RF pulse. And you'll do this some in your homework as well. So we could take a, a simple example here. And if it is just the RF pulse that's a rect function here, then it's just, of course, the amplitude times the duration gives us the integral for that RF pulse's uh, B1 envelope function. And uh, in this case, I'm carrying out this finite integral or discrete inter inter uh, integral just to solve for tau. So how long do I need to have my RF pulse on for uh, such that I get the alpha that I want given a particular B1? And so if this was a 90 degree pulse, a pi over 2 pulse, uh, and we were doing this for protons, so we have the right uh, gamma in here. Here I've chosen a large B1 max of 60 microtesla. I don't think any of our clinical systems can do that. Uh, but the result would be I'd, I'd end up with an almost 100 or, or a, a 98 microsecond RF pulse. Okay, so RF pulses are short in duration, right? Uh, this is maybe shorter than we would maybe typically achieve, but ballpark gets right, 100 microseconds, right? And I said before, RF pulses could be many hundreds of microseconds, maybe a few milliseconds, but they're typically in that ballpark. And so this is just a simple calculation for how we would get there. In your homework, you'll have to work with some different envelope functions and try to understand. But in the homework, uh, one, of the, one of the homework problems talks about a half sine wave. Uh, you could have an RF pulse that just looked like half of a sine wave, OK? You just need to design the RF pulse that has that envelope function. You'll, you'll see it. It's, as needed, we'll talk about the homework assignment more specifically. But uh, that's a bit of a tip uh, to get you going. So questions about how we sort of figure out what flip angle, what the flip angle is, or how we would, des you know, at this simple level design the RF pulse? We haven't talked about how to pick an envelope function, right? And there ends up being some kind of natural choices in MR for picking envelope functions. The rect function is a good one, nice and simple. Uh, you could have it be a sink function. It could be a Gaussian. There's, there's lots of choices, but it's, we won't get into the details as to how you pick those uh, uh, in this class. Yeah. Uh, yep, you could say that. Yeah, I mean, if you want, if you want to be, uh, well, yeah, depend. Yes. So you're just you're just identifying that here we have a dependence on the envelope function. Uh, 
whereas before I said it was just like the B1. This really is a stand-in for the amplitude of the B1 field, right? It's the envelope of that B1 field. So it could write it as B1 envelope. Okay, so that's, that's something about, uh, some insight about the, the uh, flip angle. Now let's talk about the phase. I said before the phase just uh, tells us uh, the axis about which we're rotating, right? So zero degrees by definition is x, and as, phi, as theta is increasing, then I'm, uh, I have this, uh, I guess, clock, uh, counterclockwise rotation until at 90 degrees I encounter the y-axis. I could rotate all the way to minus x or even all the way around to minus y if I wanted to. So how do we combine these two things together? Uh, what I'm going to walk you through is sort of the origins of an RF pulse operator that you'll be using in your homework assignment and we'll use some at the very end of uh, class today even. And so the idea is that uh, in, in this coordinate system here, it's actually a little bit tricky to describe, you know, how does my bulk magnetization end up pointing where it is right now? Well. If you know something about Euler angles and rotations, there's some complexity in how to specifically describe these things. But we already accept that we could describe it by an alpha and a theta, fine. How can I design an operator so that I could multiply it onto my bulk magnetization and it would end up here, right? And I'm gonna walk you through those steps. The first thing is what we call a change of basis. And so if we, use, if we have a rotation that rotates in this case about the z-axis, right? We can identify this as a two-dimensional rotation about the z-axis because this is the unit z-vector. So I'm rotating by an angle theta according to the sine and cosine terms that are in here. And that's what we call a, call a change of basis. I'm just rotating my coordinate system so I, can, uh, so I can basically project my bulk magnetization down specifically onto now the y prime axis. And conceptually, that's just easier for us to write out. So the first thing we do is a, is a change of basis, rotating into that coordinate system. And now, now what I can do is I can think about alpha as just being a rotation about x prime, right? And now I can define my x prime axis because I have this change of basis here. So now I have the rotation about x prime by my flip angle, right? And so we see in this first column, that's my x prime vector now. And I'm just rotating by alpha, the flip angle, according to these sine and cosine terms. And so if I use my left-hand rule, point my finger along x, I can just rotate simply by alpha, and I'll, be, and I'll get my vector into the right physical location. And now if I want to express the components of my bulk magnetization, but back in my lab coordinates, the x, y, and z coordinates, not the x prime, y prime coordinates, then I just have to rotate back. And rotating back is just, say, by a minus theta. And so now I bring my coordinate system back to the x and y prime uh, uh, locations. And so that, that means that to mathematically describe, one way to mathematically describe where my bulk magnetization ends up is through the composite of three rotations. Change the basis by theta, rotate by alpha, and then change the, the, the basis back by minus theta. So there's three steps there. Uh, if you use matrix al algebra to multiply these things out, we know that matrix operators go from right to left, so we have the change of basis operator multiplied by the flip angle operator multiplied by the change of basis operator. And I showed you what those, op those individual operators look like in the previous slides. There's ones and zeros and sines and cosines everywhere. If you multiply it out, you get this kind of clumsy thing, right? It's not so bad, it's just matrix multiplication, but you end up with a bunch of, uh, this is shorthanded of course, but cosine squared theta terms and cosine theta, sine theta terms. Some terms just depend on alpha. Some terms depend on theta and alpha. Conceptually, this is difficult to, to understand. I can't look at that and say, oh, I know what that does. But what I like about it is I can see that my, my uh, RF phase and my flip angle are there explicitly. And I could, I could think about how to code that up in MATLAB, right? Does that, does that terrify anyone if they have to code this up in MATLAB? The way I would do it is go back here and say, well, I have an operator. And I would just use, I would just code up that operator as an array of cosines and sines operating on theta. And then I have three of those operators and I can literally just multiply those operators out and have a composite operator, okay? I'll show you some MATLAB code for this towards the very end of class. So again, a little bit clumsy, uh, you know, I couldn't write this out uh, by memory, uh, but I can code it and I can use it and that's really handy, 
difference between like X and X bar and nine y and y prime x? Uh, yep. And so we could start off, with, let's say X, let's say the X, Y, and Z coordinates are just my lab coordinates, right? And what I want is a, is a, is a way of describing what happens to my bulk magnetization. I want, a, I want a, a, an operator, a matrix operator is, is what I'm targeting or aiming for. Uh, if I want to describe what's happening to my bulk magnetization, it can be really hard to do. You can see the result. It can be really hard to do in whatever my laboratory coordinate system is because my bulk magnetization could effectively be going sort of anywhere. So the idea is to rotate into a more convenient coordinate, coordinate system, the X prime and Y prime uh, coordinate system in this case, so that my bulk magnetization is moving specifically towards uh, 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 one of the um, underlying axes. I could do it to rotate along X prime or along Y prime. Here I chose to bring it down a y, along Y prime. For me, that's sort of visually compelling just to see that alpha is rotating exactly about X prime and exactly towards Y prime. And then I have to undo all of that if I want to actually describe what's happening in my laboratory frame still. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll come, we're going to come back to this operator at the end of the day. I'm going to show you how to code it up, and I'm going to show you how we could even use it. Uh, and so, and that'll be sort of in, in I, I wanted you to understand where it, co where it came from, because otherwise it looks like this really maybe horrible thing, right? But it's actually, there's, there's some, some good logic behind it. Okay, so we'll talk quickly about type, uh, types of RF pulses, then I think we'll work on the board for a little bit. Uh, lots of types of RF pulses, meaning we can name these pulses by, you know, sort of their underlying action. We use excitation pulses, uh, we use inversion pulses, we have refocusing pulses. These are the three main RF pulses that we'll have time to talk about in this class. For completeness, there's also saturation pulses. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about saturation pulses, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll say something now. Uh, excitation pulses are typically less than 90 degrees. Okay, so that's a good ballpark number. We'll see this in just a second. Inversion pulses are 180 degrees. The refocusing pulses are also 180 degrees, but there's some specific differences between these two categories of pulses. Saturation pulses are 90 pulses. The term comes from the idea that you can saturate the transverse plane if you play a 90 degree. I put all of my magnetization that I can into the transverse plane uh, and thereby saturate it. So these are specifically 90 degree pulses. We can get even more nuanced. There are, there are uh, RF pulses that are spectrally selective. Right? We talked very early on about how fat and water have different resonance frequencies. Other chemical species have other uh, 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 resonance frequencies. You can design an RF pulse to be specific for one resonance frequency or, or a narrow band of resonance frequencies. And consequently, you could excite only fat, and that might be a useful image. Or you could avoid exciting fat, and that might be a more useful image clinically. So so-called spectrally selective pulses. Um, we can also have what are called spectral spatial pulses where we can limit the effect of the RF pulse to a specific spatial location. We're not going to get into the details of these in this class. You, they might touch on it some in 229, the sort of follow-up to this class. Uh, and we can also have adiabatic pulses. Really, the list kind of goes on and on. We won't, we'll probably talk some about, we'll talk some about saturation pulses. In fact, it'll show up in your, in your homework assignment, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we won't get into these other pulses at all, so just kind of pointing out that they're there. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about excitation pulses. The idea is that any excitation pulse will tip MZ into the transverse plane, will generate some transverse magnetization. Uh, typically short, a couple hundred microseconds, maybe a few milliseconds. They may, in fact, uh, be non-uniform across the slice thickness. So this is something that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but in MR, we excite a slice, and that slice has some nominal thickness. It's usually on the order of millimeters. It might be four millimeters, it might be 10 millimeters thick. Uh, in point of fact, while we might want a 90 degree pulse everywhere in that slice, across the thickness, it may in fact be non-uniform. There may be a profile to our slice. It's not just perfect excitation across the slice. So it's lower at the edges, gets high in the middle, and then falls off again at the bottom. That's what we call a non-uniform uh, slice thickness or a non-uniform slice profile. Yes? How, how big is RF compared to uh, EF? Uh, it can be very big, and it, dis it, it depends. If, if you have more of an EE background, maybe it depends on the bandwidth of the RF pulse. So if it's, if it's sufficient to excite all of the frequencies in the slice, then you can do better, but a high bandwidth pulse is going to be longer <coughs> in duration. And so there's these trade-offs in MR between 
really short RF pulses and really long RF pulses, and we usually make a compromise. Does it dilute the penetration depth? Um, it, it doesn't affect the penetration depth per se. Uh, we, we haven't we haven't gotten to it yet, but um, there will to excite a slice. We have to generate a range of frequencies across the slice thickness, and so now we need an RF pulse that's tuned to all of, of to that range of frequencies. And that's difficult to get a perfect match between your RF pulse design and the exact slice that you've created this range of frequencies in. Uh, okay, so this leads to what's called an imperfect slice profile, which is really, you know, it's good to keep in mind. It means when we're looking at an image, we usually look at an image and we think of this as sort of this infinitely thin two-dimensional representation of the body, uh, but it's not. It has some thickness, and in fact, uh, it's, been, it's been sort of non-uniformly excited across the slice thickness as well. Uh, and we talked before about how it could be non-uniform within the slice, the so-called B1 inhomogeneity. We want everything to be a 90-degree pulse by design, but because of the patient, because of the B1 coil design, we may not get 90 degrees everywhere. And that's what, we, uh, so you can have non-uniformity inside the slice, and that's the B1 inhomogeneity. Um, so here's an example. We've seen this probably a few times at this point. This would just be a 90-degree excitation pulse, right? What's the phase of this RF pulse? Zero, right? So the flip angle is 90 degrees, but the phase is zero with my thumb pointing along x by 90. Uh, and then we have a small flip angle pulse on the right-hand side there. There are lots of sequences where uh, if you want to image quickly, you want to image fast, you only tip over by maybe 10 degrees. Uh, and that will, you'll see later, but that'll help you image faster under some circumstances. So 90 degrees will generate the most transverse magnetization. What we're going to learn about today, though, is relaxation. And if you tip it down really far, then it takes even longer to come back to equilibrium. And sometimes it's useful just to tip it by 10 degrees and it gets back to equilibrium pretty quickly and we can go again. And we need to keep going again. Uh, we haven't gotten to this yet either, but every time we excite with, uh, with RF energy, we only get a little bit of our imaging information. And we need lots of little bits to build up an entire image. Uh, we also have so-called inversion pulses. So inversion pulses are nominally called 180 degree pulses. And I'll, you'll, you'll see more about this uh, in the diagram down below. Uh, in principle, we're trying to get invert our MZ magnetization, right? We take it from the, its positive orientation to equilibrium, and we can invert it to be to have a, a negative uh, value, if you will. Uh, you could have less than 180. Uh, it would still be called an inversion pulse as long as you get below the transverse plane. You still get some inversion of your magnetization. So 91 degrees is an inversion pulse. Not a very good one, but it would count. Uh, and again, the point is to invert our MZ to minus MZ. And ideally, you'll produce no transverse magnetization, right? Uh, imperfections in the system, of course, will mean that you'll probably have some transverse magnetization. And so we sometimes have to deal with that in terms of whether it generates uh, image artifacts or not. We can do this as a so-called hard pulse. Uh, hard pulses are those rect functions that I've been showing you, right? They're just RF energy is turned on and then RF energy is turned off. Uh, and so those are constant RF amplitude pulses. The B1 envelope function is just a rect function. Uh, and typically, those would be non-selective. Uh, this means that we would just, uh, for, for anything the B1 coil can act on, we would invert everything, as opposed to being slice selective and inverting just a specific slice. We'll get to that more later. Uh, there are other possibilities. Don't worry too much about the soft pulses. But any, anything that's not a rect function is basically going to be a soft pulse. You have some maybe more interesting B1 envelope function. Uh, and we'll typically have to follow this by what's called a crusher gradient. I said we ideally produce no MXY. Uh, we'll in a, invariably produce some, and applying a so-called crusher gradient will effectively destroy the transverse magnetization uh, after that RF pulse. This will be more meaningful and important later. If we just look at an example of what the inversion pulse does, it literally just tips the magnetization by 180 degrees. So again, RF phase here is zero. I'm tipping all the way past 90 plus another 90, and I can invert my magnetization. What gets really interesting and why these pulses are, are, are kind of fascinating is when, uh, when you look at the effects of relaxation after an inversion pulse. And we'll do that, uh, I think, maybe in a few slides even. I forget. It comes up today for sure. Uh, another kind of RF pulse that you'll see a bunch, uh, especially when we get to the spin echo lecture, is called a refocusing pulse. Uh, also measured typically as having a flip angle of 180 degrees, but it serves a very different purpose. I probably should have said that the 
purpose of the inversion pulses is really to manipulate image contrast and specifically to manipulate the T1 contrast. And we'll see some of that in some slides I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, the, the application sort of utility, the refocusing pulse will become much more apparent when we talk about spin echo. So I think I'll go through this a little bit because it'll be more important to come back to it uh, uh, when we actually get to the spin echo lecture. If you look at what's happening, uh, the refocusing pulse is going to be applied after some other excitation pulse. So we use lots of different RF pulses in putting together the whole imaging experiment. So imagine that your transverse magnetization is, or your, your bulk magnetization rather, is already lying somewhere towards the transverse plane. The refocusing pulse is actually going to uh, flip it over this way. Okay, now that's not an obvious thing, but think about what my, say, x-axis is doing. The so the phase of this pulse is phase about the y-axis, right? So what angle is that? What's my theta? Ninety, right? So I go from zero along x, and I rotate my thumb out to y. It's just ninety degrees, and that's my phase, right? Now my flip angle I said is one eighty. If you think about what's happening to the to a sort of a theoretical x vector here, it would flip all the way over to be along the minus x vector, right? We'll come back to more examples of the refocusing pulse later and the importance of the refocusing pulse later. Uh, sometimes it's hard to conceptualize why that's also a one eighty pulse, but if you think about what's happening to the x uh, axis here, it would also flip over to be the minus x axis, if you will. And that's what a refocusing pulse does. Why you want to do that, sort of a little bit how we do that will come up uh, in a, just a couple lectures. So lots of different RF pulses. Um, so kind of summarizing, this is again just the end of lecture three, right? Summarizing, we have defined uh, an RF field that would be circularly polarized rather than linearly polarized. And now we've given uh, you some insight as the, the origins of this RF pulse operator. And the idea is you have a matrix operator here. If I told you what theta to use and I told you what alpha to use, you would be able to define the components of this matrix operator and it could act on some bulk magnetization vector, whatever components it has. And it would tell you where does the bulk magnetization end up as a consequence of that RF operator. All right? We can rotate, push around, force our bulk magnetization to process through the application of this RF operator. And then we talked some about, and we'll see a little bit more today, uh, I think it's uh, basically next, about how the uh, flip angle itself, alpha, is defined from the integral of the B1 envelope function. And then we got some insight as to defining the theta and the alpha for a specific RF pulse. Uh, we worked through uh, a fair bit of math last time as, as well uh, so that we could get into the so-called rotating frame. And so we ended up with uh, uh, the, the equation of motion, right, in the rotating frame. Uh, and what was a little bit unusual here is we had to have this so-called fictitious field show up here, which basically demodulates the effects of the background B0 field and lets us precess or spin around uh, at the same frequency. We could simplify uh, this whole expression. It shows up at the end here. Uh, so that it sort of has a maybe slightly more familiar uh, form just by substituting in the B effective. But B effective was just the sum of this fictitious field plus the B field described in the rotating frame. And so the trick, one of the tricks that we had to work through last time was for a given laboratory co coordinate frame B field, how do I describe it in the rotating frame? We had to make this substitution between our uh, coordinate axes from the I i j axes to the i prime j prime axes. Uh, and so the, the result of this, in, for the simplest case, right, so here we have free precession, but in the rotating frame, and we're not introducing relaxation, right? We worked through what was our B effective uh, for free precession, and it just ends up being zero, right? Those terms canceled out in the, uh, the, the fictitious field and the, the B zero field itself. And so now our uh, equation of motion has a pretty simple form. We can express it in sort of the determinant form and then write out a system of differential equations, but they have sort of trivial solutions, right? It just says that in the rotating frame, the bulk magnetization doesn't really change, right? It just has some, uh, has some orientation and it just sort of hangs out there. Uh, in the lab frame, of course, it's zipping around at 64 megahertz or whatever, and we saw that solution at the end of the lecture before the last lecture. Uh, so then where we were sort of ending at the end of the last lecture was to go from free precession to forced precession, right? Now I want to do something more interesting. We said that in the, in the rotating, sorry, in the laboratory frame, it was kind of complicated to describe what was happening to the bulk magnetization. 
let's take a simpler approach. We'll go into the rotating frame. The trick was, again, to define our, our B effective in the rotating frame, but with a circularly polarized field, we just ended up, uh, when we let the phase go at least, we just ended up with a single component for the B1 uh, field here. And so now this determinant operator gives us a new system of differential equations, and now we have to work at understanding the solution to this set of linear, uh, sorry, first order coupled differential equations. And so the last thing I did was I wrote out uh, we sort of jumped to, but I wrote out a solution for this system of equations, recognizing that our envelope function was in fact a function of time and not just a constant, right? So uh, you should be comfortable with and familiar with how to sort of get to the system of equations, right? How, how you go from the system of equations maybe to the solution. Again, this isn't a differential equations class. I'll give you you know, the tools to, to get there, but I don't, I don't necessarily expect you to solve systems of differential equations. I expect you to know how to set up the system of equations. Uh, it's a little too much to go all the way, although many of you probably understand or, or know already. Okay, so questions about sort of how we landed where we landed? Again, this is just wrapping up lecture three at this point. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a couple minutes to write down uh, uh, where we kind of left off and then we'll finish out that problem and then we'll start the next lecture. Good? Okay. Give me two minutes here. Oh, we'll take, we'll, um, what's the time actually? Yeah, let me get through this uh, first and we can talk at the break though for sure. Yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, so, the, the, the A solution to that system of equations that I just had up there on the board, this is the, kind of the last thing that we wrote uh, uh, at the end of class last time, was to say that our mx of t is a function of time just depended on some initial, oops, depends on what our initial condition is for our x magnetization. Uh, and then we could write down our my magnetization as a function of time. Uh, and this is where things got a little bit interesting. And we said, well, it depends. There was this nice discussion about what should this leading coefficient be. It is mz superscript zero, and it's sine uh, times. And in this case, we have this integral in here, and I'll explain this a little bit more in just a second, times gamma b1 envelope as a function of time, uh, say d. Oops, I should write that as a tau. D tau. Uh, and then I can write down the solution for my mz prime magnetization. And it, of course, looks pretty similar. It's just mz0 cosine of the same thing. So integral from 0 to t gamma b1 envelope of tau. Um, so one question would be, well, what, what are we integrating? What are we integrating over? What's our B1 envelope function maybe even look like? So we could pick a simple case, and we could say, well, let's just choose the, the rect case. And so let's say our B1 envelope function just looks something like this. And so it has some amplitude that's, uh, I don't know if I really care here, called B1. And it's turned on at some time zero and it's turned off at some time tau RF, right? So that's the, basically the simplest RF pulse that we can work with. Um, and so mathematically, if I want to describe this RF pulse, we have this kind of awkward B1, uh, sorry, rect uh, function. So we'd write it as B1 envelope as a function of time uh, would be equal to some amplitude B1 so I could label the amplitude of this pulse here as being B1, some nominal uh, value. And then I write the rect function as this little bracket operator. Uh, this is the same thing that the Liang and Lauter uh, book does. And then we define this as tau RF uh, by 2, I think, yeah, divided by tau RF. This is just the formal way of writing out what a, uh, rect function does or looks like. Uh, and so this function here, 
just means that it's going to be have an amplitude of b1 for 0 to less, uh, to say less than, I guess I had tau as my integrator, uh, tau rf. And it's going to be 0 otherwise. So that's the kind of most formal way that we could write down the b1 envelope function for uh, the rect uh, uh, RF pulse that we've shown. And so what we need to do is then just integrate that. In this case, what we care about, uh, we can do this for a, a finite integral, and we know that the RF pulse itself goes to time tau RF. And so I just want to integrate that rect function, uh, which you kind of can expect what that function or what that answer is going to look like. Um, and so I could write, uh, after carrying out the integral of the rect function over there, I can say uh, my mx term, of course, just looks the same. So I have mx uh, prime of t still equal to mx0. My my prime of t uh, is going to be mz0 sine of gamma v1 tau rf. Oops, v1. And so it's not surprising, right, uh, how my y component develops or, or evolves as a function of time depends on some initial condition, how much magnetization did I have to begin with. And now I'm tipping it over slowly according to some sine function. And the amount of, uh, uh, oh, sorry, this should just be a, a t in here. Right, so the amount of uh, the the projection of my mz magnetization onto my y component just increases as time is increasing, and it's proportional to my gamma and the amplitude of my v1 field. So the bigger my v1 field, uh, the faster it's going to tip over. We can write the z component as well. Of course, it just carries out from the cosine term, so we end up with mz prime of t is equal to m z zero cosine of gamma v1 t. Uh, and then the, the case that we're really interested in here is for 0 less than some time t less than and up to some time tau rf. So we can, we can talk about how as time is evolving, what's the state of our MX, MY, and MZ components? So if you uh, wanted to, and you'll see some of this at the end in, in MATLAB and things like that, you can discretize this very easily, right? We could talk about small delta time steps, right? And a small delta time step would give you, uh, part, you know, just part of the nutation. And then the next delta T would give you a little bit more nutation. And the next delta T would give you a little more nutation. We'll talk about setting this up or something similar up so that you could write this, uh, so you could see the evolution, if you will, of mx, my, and mz as a function of time. Uh, you could easily plot these functions. I want to talk about sort of simulating things like this as well. So questions about sort of where this solution comes from or how we get there? Okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. So the picture that we have in mind, uh, say the initial condition would be, um, uh, would be just. I guess we didn't write it down. Maybe we did at the end of the last class, but we would have m x zero equal to zero, m y zero equal to zero, and m z zero equal to maybe m not. Okay. So no transverse magnetization. And the initial mz magnetization is just the equilibrium magnetization that's possible. Thank you. OK, let me, um, uh, let me see where I am in this. Question, sorry, questions about what's up here? OK, that's going to go down. This is going to come back up. 
Okay. So uh, let's keep working for a bit, and then uh, and then we'll take a break, maybe in uh, ten minutes or something like that. So. The idea today, of course, is to come back to the block equations, mostly in the rotating frame, but to get us into this idea about relaxation as well. And so I alluded to this earlier. Uh, uh, no, I didn't allude to this. I was talking about a different Nobel Prize. So uh, this, uh, <laughs> uh, these two guys, uh, Ed Bloch, or sorry, Felix Bloch and Ed Purcell, got the 1952 Nobel Prize for basically their, their conceptualization and inventions regarding the detection of uh, the NMR phenomena. Uh, I don't know the history here. Somehow Bloch ended up naming the equations and Purcell gets named after a few phenomena or his name is attributed with a few phenomena. So this is what uh, the Bloch equations with relaxation look like. And uh, in some ways this is one of the most interesting and one of the most satis uh, sort of satisfying set of uh, equations, but they have kind of an un unsatisfying origin, if you will. What I liked a lot about the first part of this expression, right? So the first part was just the equation of motion. We've seen this in kind of a, several different forms at this point. And there's a way that we could derive it, right? We came up with the equation of motion from first principles, essentially. These terms here, which describe relaxation, right? So we're going to learn about T2 today, and we're going to learn about T1 today. Uh, unfortunately, they are phenomenological terms, right? What does that mean? Well, there are good physical principles governing the, the leading terms, the equation of motion. These two, these, two, uh, these two terms at the end there, they basically get added on because they describe what we see well, right? There's no way to get there. They fit the data. They match what we observe. Uh, they describe the phenomena, right? But in some ways, that's really unsatisfying, right? Like you'd really want some like way of getting there, right? And, and you can't. Uh, and what you end up with, for better or for worse, is a, is a pretty complicated differential equation. Uh, as expressed, it's an ordinary differential equation, but it's coupled and it's nonlinear. And that means solving this system of equations is really tricky under general circumstances. There are some specific circumstances. We'll work through some of them probably next lecture. Uh, but in gen there's no general solution to that system of equations. Uh, and as a consequence, numerical solutions uh, are really valuable. Of course, there's a numerical solution under whatever conditions you sort of come up with. Um, and that's part of what this class is going to be about. How can we actually simulate this system of equations so that we can un have an understanding for what a spin system is doing uh, and, and get some insight to the NMR and MR phenomena beyond the simple examples that we've uh, been talking about so far. Uh, if we look and break down these different terms, then I said it before, but this first term here we should recognize as governing precession, right? Uh, you could say precession and nutation. It's, any, uh, it's the effect of the B field acting on the bulk magnetization, right? But what we have to introduce now is this idea of what we call transverse relaxation and longitudinal relaxation. This term here is called transverse relaxation. It depends only on T2, which we'll learn about today. And you can see that it only governs the, say, the X and Y components of the magnetization. And there's a second term, or rather the third term here, the longitudinal relaxation term, only regards MZ along the K direction here. So there's very separate kind of phenomena, if you will. Uh, and yet there's some interaction between what happens on the longitudinal axis and what happens in the transverse plane. Uh, but they have separate and, and uh, relatively independent uh, relaxation parameters. And you'll see why these are relaxation parameters in a second. Uh, this is going to give rise to some exponential functions when you solve the differential equations. And so things tend to relax back to some state, some equilibrium state. So we recognize precession at the front, at the front end there. Uh, and we recognize relaxation on the last two terms there. The T1 changes are relatively slow. They're on the order of hundreds of milliseconds or even seconds. Uh, the T2 changes are pretty fast. They're on the order of tens of milliseconds, maybe hundreds of milliseconds. What's really interesting is, uh, and I'll show you this shortly, um, because of things like relaxation and by using things like uh, inversion pulses and so forth, we can actually manipulate the bulk magnetization to be zero, for example, at some point in time. And what that means, and, and what you'll see shortly, is we can, we can basically get rid of the signal from a particular tissue if we want to. And that's kind of a remarkable thing, right? I don't think there's other imaging modalities that have that kind of flexibility. Because every tissue has its own T1 and T2, we can design experiments for specific things to be very, very dark. And clinically, that could be really useful. How do we get rid of the fat? We don't want the fat to confuse our diagnosis. It's not really that interesting from a clinical perspective. 
How do we get rid of the blood so we can see small things inside the arteries? Things like that. So there's some really wild uh, contrast manipulations that we can make. Uh, it's also possible, in fact, to include the effects of diffusion. It's something that we'll talk about very late in the class in one of the applications uh, lectures. Uh, there is a formal description for the effects of diffusion on spin systems. So we keep talking about water. We keep talking about the protons in water. Uh, you have to remember that that water is going to freely diffuse in our tissues and so forth. And there's actually some incredibly powerful MR techniques that leverage the diffusion sensitivity of the block equations for understanding the tissue microenvironment, for example. Uh, when they're updated to include diffusion, then we call it the block Tori equations. So this is the example that you should have in your head of what uh, excitation and relaxation looks like. So if we start off from the beginning here, these spins are kind of wobbling around and slowly being excited until they're in the transverse plane. Uh, but they're not stable in that state. They don't just stay there, right? They tend to relax back, uh, still kind of precessing the whole time, but they tend to relax back to their equilibrium state. Uh, and so MR is all about forcing the magnetization to do something with an RF pulse for a, a brief period of time, and then it's going to relax back to an equilibrium state or maybe some dynamic equilibrium state. Uh, but qualitatively, that's uh, what's happening. And in fact, that animation is driven by uh, the block equations themselves. Um, we can update this equation. We won't go through procedurally how we do that uh, so that we can express everything in the rotating frame. And there's some subtle differences here, but the big one is we have to use the effective B field, which would include that fictitious field and a description of the B fields uh, as they would be described in the rotating frame. Uh, and so we've seen this a, a few times now. We just have to make sure we use the right B field uh, in this term here. Uh, under certain, under certain circumstances, uh, this system of equations will get even easier. So if we think about free precession, for example, do you guys remember what happens to this chunk of terms when there's free precession? This goes to zero, right? And that's oftentimes what we're going to be interested in MR. There's a brief period of forced precession, and we have to describe what's happening. But during very brief periods, we don't necessarily care about relaxation. And so we can just care about uh, the governing equation being the, the equation of motion. And then when we stop playing the RF pulse, for example, we're no longer, uh, uh, we're no longer, cared, no longer care about the precession uh, per se and the rotating frame in particular. This is going to go to zero because there's no applied B1 field. And then the relaxation terms actually become important. So we kind of flip-flop between these two states and two kind of uh, versions of this governing equation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about T1 relaxation. I, I said this earlier, and, and if you know something about MR, you probably know this. Uh, and the idea is that different uh, tissues have different T1s and have different T2s. And that's really, again, that's another reason that we're in this room at all, right? If the T1s were all really, really close and the T2s were all really, really close, there wouldn't be much contrast and MR wouldn't have the, the clinical utility that it does. And so there's no reason to memorize this table per se, but it's definitely important to remember uh, uh, conceptually that things like CSF tend to have really long uh, T1s uh, and relatively long T2s. Uh, and that the other end of the spectrum is fat. Fat has a really short T1 and a kind of intermediate T2. Uh, and then you can pick your other favorite tissue, right? If you're going to be doing neural research, then maybe you want to know something about gray matter and white matter. If you're going to be doing cardiac or liver research, then you should probably, uh, you know, understand some slightly different values. Again, at least as engineers, you want to have a ballpark feel for what these numbers look like. So at one extreme, there are many seconds. At the other extreme, there are hundreds of milliseconds. And it's good to conceptualize that because it, it, it does play an important role. And the idea, uh, this is the same axial slice through the same subject. And just by manipulating our imaging parameters, right, changing some knobs, dialing knobs on the MR scanner, we can get some very, very different image contrast in that same subject. And that can help draw out you know, conspicuity for underlying disease, response to therapy, you know, what's the anatomy of this particular subject or patient. So really amazing that you can get this kind of flexibility of image contrast just by changing some, some acquisition parameters, essentially. So what is, uh, what is T1 relaxation anyway? Uh, it's usually referred to as longitudinal or spin lattice relaxation, this idea that the, the spins themselves are interacting with the, the lattice of their environment. Uh, gives rise to so-called T1 relaxation. We said already that it's kind of hundreds to thousands of milliseconds. Interestingly, it does change a little bit with B0. 
so if you go to a higher field, then your T1s actually lengthen a little bit. Uh, and that means, again, if you have a protocol at 1.5T, that's not going to work identically at 3T. That's uh, at least another reason. Uh, and importantly, and this, we do this a lot clinically and, and for research purposes, we can use contrast agents. We can inject a, like an intravenous contrast agent. So the, the, the uh, agent itself is in your blood, for example, but the blood, of course, perfuses tissues. Contrast agents will only decrease T1s. We don't have T1 lengthening uh, contrast agents. They always just shorten T1. Um, and a good sort of rule of thumb, this comes up a lot if you're trying to interpret or understand an image. Uh, you'll probably see something like this on your final. Uh, but short T1s are bright on a T1-weighted image. Right? You kind of want to remember, and we'll talk much later about how we generate a T1-weighted image. That is, how do we have an image that emphasizes T1 contrast? How do we have an image that emphasizes T2 contrast? But when we're able to generate a T1-weighted image, then short T1s are going to be bright. So what's an example of something that would be bright? What's a tissue type that would be bright? Fat, right? It's always, you know, fat's a, a great example. Short T1, it's going to be bright on a T1-weighted image. Um, we'll talk about where this actually comes from a little bit later, but the idea here is just mapping out uh, 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 the relaxation uh, of the magnetization for different tissue types. And so we haven't seen the governing equations that drive this yet. We'll get there shortly. Uh, but if we map out relaxation for white matter and gray matter, given their underlying T1s, you can see that they follow slightly different paths. So the picture to have in mind is white matter and gray matter have been saturated into the transverse plane. So I have no longitudinal magnetization. And once they're saturated, their tendency is to return back to equilibrium. But they're going to do so at different rates. And so white matter is going to recover more quickly because it's got a shorter time constant. And gray matter is going to recover more slowly because it's got a longer time constant. And this difference in time constants is what gives rise to image contrast. If I somehow took an image really quickly here, I wouldn't have much contrast, right? Their signal amplitudes would be very, very similar. And if I wait a really long period of time, they've both recovered. And I also don't have much contrast, right? <coughs> so MR imaging is all about timing your imaging experiment. In this case, we've played a saturation pulse. Let's time our imaging experiment so we can get the most contrast, say, between white matter and gray matter, if that's the target for that exam, at least. Uh, so this is uh, the governing equation for this. This comes out of that differential equation uh, that I showed you earlier. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about solutions if we have uh, time. Well, we probably won't have time today. We'll probably get to it in the next lecture. Uh, but mathematically, this is, uh, uh, expresses the return to equilibrium uh, or uh, yeah, the return to equilibrium of the bulk magnet of the Z component of the magnetization, uh, specifically for free precession in the lab or the rotating frame with relaxation. So notice it doesn't matter what frame we're in when we talk about Z. Right? The z-axes were shared for both of these, so we just refer to them in the same way. So mz as a function of time depends on two terms, the so-called prepared magnetization and this so-called returned equilibrium uh, uh, term. The prepared magnetization is uh, sort of a, the comp a component of the magnetization that you've somehow perturbed. You played some previous RF pulses, and there's some, uh, there's some sort of history in the magnetization, if you will. Um, this term is going to decay. Anything you prepare, anytime you sort of perturb the magnetization, of course it, it's an unstable state. It's going to decay. It's going to go away. Uh, and if the system is left uh, unperturbed, uh, we're talking about free precession after all, then there will be a return to thermal equilibrium, right? Meaning for very, very, very long times uh, relative to the underlying T1, this term will go to zero, right? So that's this purple term here sort of decaying to zero. And the return to equilibrium term here means that the magnetization wants, wants, so to speak, to get back to M0, right? So for very long periods of time, your MZ magnetization eventually gets back to your M0 magnetization. Uh, we can uh, similarly talk about the T relaxation. So here we're talking about what happens in the transverse plane. And this is also referred to as spin-spin relaxation. So spins interacting with spins. Um, typically short, sort of tens or maybe hundreds of milliseconds. And interestingly, it's relatively independent of B0. So we said T1 can get longer with increasing uh, B0. T2 stays about the same. Uh, it's always the case uh, that T2 will be less than T1, uh, sort of physically, the, the, what governs these things. Uh, 
Um, and we can, in fact, decrease T2 with a contrast agent. So we said before we could shorten T1. We can also shorten T2. That has very different effects on image contrast, but that's what the current class of contrast agents is able to do. And in distinction, it would be good to go back and compare, say, these elements to the T1 relaxation slide. But here uh, we recognize that a long T2 is bright on a T2-weighted image. So what's, a, what's an example of something that would be bright if I was able to generate a T2-weighted image? CSF is a good example. And so there are techniques, and we'll learn about these when we get to the spin echo lecture. Sometimes having really bright CSF is distracting. CSF is not usually that interesting from a clinical perspective, uh, meaning that the pathology is not in the CSF or not as apparent on MR. So we would like to get rid of the CSF signal and then be able to see you know, other details of the brain more carefully. And so we'll learn about how we can suppress specifically things like uh, long T2 species uh, using uh, like a flare sequence would be one example. Uh, again, different tissues have different T1s, different T2s. They're not always that different, right? This is a 10% you know, difference. It's pretty small. And we can map out the decay of, these, of the signals for these two different species. So in this case here, we're looking at the magnitude of the transverse magnetization. So imagine I have white matter and gray matter, and I tip them over by 90 degrees. If I tip them over by 90 degrees, then my transverse magnetization is quite high. Right? If I tip them over by 90 degrees and try to take a picture right away, do I have much contrast? No. no right? What if, I tip them over right away? what if I tip them over and then I wait a long time to take a picture? Not much contrast, right? So everything in MR is about is an optimization, right? If contrast is what I care about, if what I want is the maximum white matter, gray matter contrast, I can actually calculate that if I know what my T2 is for those two tissues. And I can figure out the timing for my imaging experiment so that I could get the maximum contrast. And while this might look pretty small, it's enough to give us you know, relative to our noise floor, it's enough to give us meaningful image contrast in a, in a T2 weighted image. So T2 weighting would be when you have, say, the maximum difference between uh, two different uh, tissues based on their T2. Uh, so the equation that governs this, and we'll see where this comes from, uh, uh, like I said, I think in the next lecture, the uh, transverse magnetization, whatever state it has at some point in time, it only wants to decay. Under, under free precession, right? So this is free precession and specifically in the rotating frame, right? Uh, and including relaxation, of course. So the transverse magnetization only decays as a function of time. And so if I have three different uh, tissues, liver fat and CSF, I can tip them all over into the transverse plane, but their component of magnetization in the transverse plane is only going to decay, right? That component's coming down as time advances. Uh, and again, depending on you know, what my goal is, at different times I can get different amounts of contrast between, say, any two of these tissues. Very early on I have very little contrast and very late I have quite a bit of contrast. But just mapping out the trajectory for different tissues. Okay, so we're moving through reasonably quickly. Let's go ahead and take a break, uh, you know, kind of five minute break. And when we come back I want to uh, get into you know how we can use MATLAB. Uh, uh, we'll talk about some theoretical aspects first, and then how we can use MATLAB to actually start looking at what's happening to spin systems. So, kind of five minute break is good. Does it apply for the explanation of T1 and T2 has difference in are uh, very different? Like, even if uh, the T2 uh, is already zero, we still have the remaining. T1 there, or the T1 has to um, come back to the original value. Don't, 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 don't refer to those as T1 okay. and T2. Talk about those as like MZ, so longitudinal magnetization, or transverse magnetization. Okay. Right? So yeah, T1 right. and T2 are the the just the time constants. Yeah, right. right? So, so over time, if we, have, we are at T equal to T2, like, uh, like we looking for from the different time domain, mm -hmm. that, that in the time domain, at certain time point, uh, T, uh, the M, M transfer is already zero. Uh, yeah, it's tricky. It's exponential. So maybe not zero, but maybe 1%. Okay, yeah. Right? Yeah, very small. But very small. The, but the, um, the, the MZ hasn't come back to... Yeah, MZ might only be at 20%. Right, yeah. yeah. That's the part that I cannot explain through this kind of uh, uh, visual 
it's difficult, right? right. I, can't, I can't do it with my arms very well, right? Okay. right? Yeah. The governing equations describe it beautifully, okay. right? So you can, you can see this in the governing equations, just like you're picturing it right now, that yeah. you know, the, the longitudinal magnetization is, is recovering very slowly, but the transverse magnetization is disappearing, yeah, right? right? Yeah. Circle, you could redo it. You know, you could have a lot more. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm sure. One more question that yeah, is yeah. not relevant to today's uh, talk. Okay. So, uh, for some of the materials, like nickel, they are ferromagnetic. Yeah. So, these materials are still, like, cannot go into this uh, MRI scan. Sure. Or is it, like, <laughs> possible that it can be going to it, It's possible, but there are definitely some, some, some very important safety considerations. It depends on their mass. Right, it depends on how much of this are you talking about, okay. and it depends on for what purpose. Yeah, I'm thinking right. about my uh, the coil, our yeah. coil. That there are some elements that have, like there are some parts. Yeah, I mean very very elements. small elements that may not matter, right? So like it's a it's a it's, it's a balance of forces, okay. right? And yeah. so if your coil has other non ferromagnetic mass, yes, right, that right. overwhelms the small magnetic moments of these components, okay. it may not be a problem. But it, but it has to be sorted out, has to okay, be has to addressed. Be and ideally, happening. it's not there. Okay, right. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sir. I have a stupid small question. No, no, uh, nothing stupid, in, nothing in, small. In this uh, session, I think uh -huh. it should not be the precession frequency for the B1 field, right? B1 uh, field is not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. B1 field is not precession. It's oscillation. Well, it's, it's. Oscillation, right. It's, it's, it's asking about it's a better. That's a better word. I agree. Mutation. Yeah, but I think this should be like the precession, the frequency of the mag mag magnetiz magnetization, which is tied to the B1 field, right, I guess. Because this is like asking what happened to the B1 field, but actually this problem is asking about the thing, right? So it's, it's this, this is find omega 1. Yes. So nutational frequency, find yeah, but this for the B1 field. But thing, B1 for the B1 yeah, field? Yeah, oh, sure. Should, yeah. Should yeah, 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 no, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, it, I would say it's a very small difference, but I would interpret those the same. So sure, with respect to the B1 field, that's fine. Yeah, but when I was looking at this question, I was thinking, well, when it's asking about the oscillation frequency of the B1, or it's asking about the precession of the mag magnetization. You're talking about nutation of the magnetization. Yes. Yes. So but when I saw yeah. this line, I saw this. Yeah, it no, but I, we agree. Fine. No, 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 it's not, no, it's fine, but we agree. We're, we're good, yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's good, that's a good question. I could make it more clear. Hey. I have a question just sure, sure. I, don't, I don't understand. Why yep. is there a return thermodelivered B1 relaxation? Uh -huh. Nothing in the transverse relaxation. Uh, I, I guess I didn't say it that way. Um, let's, let's, let's maybe back up three or four steps. What is the equilibrium state of the magnetization? The equilibrium state is when yeah. it's in this, uh, both magnetations are pointing directly in the two directions. Perfect. Right, so no matter what I do to my spin system, no matter how I act on it, no matter what I do, it that's where it wants to end up, right? Okay. And so I know, just based on that thought experiment, oh, I know so that my transverse has to go away. You have to disappear and then yeah, you that's return. the return to equilibrium. Okay, so yeah. that's so maybe I didn't say it explicitly, but okay. yeah. And uh, then and yeah. So here, basically, there's m naught, m z naught. Well, <laughs> there's a small difference in in sort of how what what how Lauterbur writes things and how I write things. And I've got a slide about this that I'll, I'll have to talk about at some point. Okay. I think of, of, of pure equilibrium, right, like infinite time, that that's M naught. Okay. He calls that MZ naught. Okay. Right, and I don't, I don't think that's good nomenclature, actually. Okay. But I don't know if he'll ever talk to me about that or not. Huh. Okay. <laughs> I'll probably, I should probably talk about that slide. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, so here, if there's an MZ component, Mx and Mx and My is zero. No. Or is it now? Is well, no, no, no. Well, I'm not sure. So we're only talking about the z component, uh -huh. right? So there's nothing else happening except for the z component. Okay. And this is saying that the magnitude, the the mz component as a function of time is related. To, its magnitude is related to m zero. The direction is always just k. Okay. Right. Oh, it's just okay. k. Gotcha. K. And this just tells you that it's it's slowly returning to that m naught value. Okay. Is that good? I think so. We'll go through a few examples too. So, you know, if, if it doesn't quite sink in, let me know. But this is specifically talking about what happens along the Z direction, just the K hat direction. Okay. I guess I don't understand why you wouldn't specify MZ naught then. Well, MZ naught shows up here as the, as what I refer to as the perturbed or initial condition 
magnetization. Okay. And he and doesn't he doesn't make a distinction between. In my mind, I could start an experiment not at equilibrium. Okay. Right. I could okay. have already done something to my experiment to my system. Okay. And if I start from a non-equilibrium state, then I need to have some mz naught initial condition. Okay. And then I make the distinction that at infinite times I go to m naught, which is the like, the uh, equilibrium, like right, just equilibrium. maximum possible gotcha. bulk magnetization. Okay. I think it's I a very good it. question, I but I, I'll, I should probably talk to the class about it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. 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 No, it's good. I like it. Hey. Basically, blacking out certain organs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, our tissue types. Tissue types. Yeah. So, um, I mean, are they actually zero, or is this kind of like you can get them really close to zero, but not sort of exactly zero? But then you said oscillation. So, what are you what are you thinking about? I was just wondering if you know, are you ever given the like complexity of the human body? Are you ever yeah. actually able to cancel anything out? Uh, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, it's not perfect. Yeah. yeah, it's not perfect. So things like fat sat, like saturating fat, that's yeah. still kind of an, a little bit of an open problem. Like it, it should work, right? I just told you, right? It should work, right? But then when you go and actually go to try to do it, there's reasons it doesn't. And so um, there's, there's different reasons for that. But I might design an RF pulse to invert fat. But it may not invert the fat that's over here because that fat is in a different part of the field and it's not acting the same way. So I invert but really, I can only I can only operate on frequencies, yeah. and so I can I can manipulate this range of frequencies. But if fat over here is at a different frequency, it just won't see that pulse, yeah. and so fat's out will work here, mm -hmm. but it won't work over there. And then clinically, that's super annoying for them, right? It's like I wanted fat sat, but I got kind of nine, I got mostly what I wanted, right? <laughs> that's super un unsatisfying, right? Okay, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and make a, a couple of comments. There's, there's a, frequently some really good questions at the break, and I wanna come back and sort of address some of these things. So I, I showed you this expression. I didn't show you where it came from, and, we, and I don't think we're gonna get to that today, but that's okay. Uh, remember that this is specifically and only what's happening to the Z magnetization, right? So if I wanted to be maybe more consistent with other things I've written, I should, I should put like a K hat vector on here, right? There's, no, there's nothing else going on. This is exactly and only what happens to the, the Z component of my magnetization. I've also introduced a difference in nomenclature between the Lang and Lauterer book and what we use in this class. And I need to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, in my mind, when you do these experiments, uh, there's the potential that you want to describe the MZ magnetization uh, for an experiment that doesn't begin at the equilibrium state, right? You've already messed around with the system. You've already been doing something. And now you want to say, what happens to MZ? If you've already perturbed the system, then there is some initial condition. There is some component to my MZ magnetization that I call the initial condition, which is MZ naught, okay? Whatever I've done to perturb the system, that term is not, it's not stable, right? I'm always going to, for infinite times, return back to equilibrium. And the distinction I make in this class is I call the, the final state or the true equilibrium state just M naught, okay? I think Lauterberg calls that MZ naught. And I like to make a distinction between what's happening right at the beginning of some experiment. This could be zero. It could be M naught, right? That's okay. Uh, it just depends on what I've done to my system. It could be negative M naught if I have an inversion pulse, for example. Uh, so let's make sure we understand this is only and exactly what's happening along just the K direction. It's only the Z component after all. And then um, and that we make a distinction between some initial condition and some ultimate equilibrium state. Any questions about that? And then if you do the thought experiment again, no matter how we've perturbed the system, no matter what the state of the magnetization is, we all know that at the end of the day, hopefully we appreciate it, at the end of the day, the bulk magnetization should just be pointing straight up, right? So the vector description would just be the 0, 0, 1 vector, right? Or the 0, 0, M naught vector, right? And so that gets to the next thing, which is T2 relaxation. Uh, this expression here should maybe make a little bit of sense now too that I could have some initial condition. I could have some initial state for my transverse magnetization. It depends what I've been doing to my system. Uh, 
but for long times under free precession, for long times, that's not a stable state. My transverse magnetization will disappear, decay, and I'll only be left with my Z magnetization pointing exactly along the K direction. Okay? We'll see the origins of these things later, uh, like I said. Okay, so I want to spend some time talking about MATLAB, and, and I'm doing this maybe a little bit out of order, meaning a little bit earlier in, in this lecture, because I want to give you uh, some, some tools to work with for uh, your upcoming homework assignment and help you appreciate uh, 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 you know, why simulation could be a useful tool here. I said it before that the block equations themselves are these coupled nonlinear differential equations. General solutions aren't available. If you do anything interesting in research, you won't have an analytic solution. If, if, you, if you come up with a new analytic solution, come knock on my door, we'll write a paper. Um, but so let's talk a little bit about MATLAB and then before that some, some sort of mathematical entry that will help, ex help you understand better why I formulate things in MATLAB in a particular way. Um, so part of what this class is going to give you the tools, uh, 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 one of the tools you're going to build is you're going to build your own block equation simulator and we're going to kind of do this in steps until the final homework assignment. You'll have a longer period of time to work on it, but you'll basically write your own block equation simulator. It's not that crazy. It sounds kind of crazy, but you can do it in, I don't know, maybe, maybe 30 or 40 lines of code or something like that uh, if, if you're efficient. Uh, okay, so these are the uh, block equations. This is in the rotating frame and specifically during free precession, right? So when it was free precession, we lost our, uh, the, the sort of, um, uh, the uh, cross product term that was on the leading end here. And so now we have uh, a system of differential equations, the solutions of which we've already seen, right? It's these exponential decay functions for the Z magnetization and the transverse magnetization. You could write this out in, in sort of matrix formulation. Uh, I like matrix math, I like tensors, I like MATLAB, and so there's a reason that I think this is uh, sort of a good exercise. So. If I want to write the same differential equation out in matrix form, it's not so hard. I have dm, dt. We've seen this before. I just have three components to that vector. It's my mx, my mz component. Fine. Uh, if I want to handle the relaxation terms here, it's also not that bad. I can just put the relaxation terms on the diameter. It's obviously 1 over t1 or 1 over t2. And now if I do my matrix multiplication, I'll just end up uh, say in this case, uh, 1 over t2 or minus 1 over t2 times mx, and that takes care of this term right here, right? Same thing, I come to this term here, I'm going to have a 0 times mx, I'm going to have a 1 over t2 times my my, uh, and then, uh, uh, then I should pick, on a, uh, pick up my mz uh, value as, as well when I go through the third column. And so I can see that I get my mx, my my, and my mz term. What's a little tricky, uh, and I'm going to show you a, a trick around this, is if I also need to account for this return to equilibrium term here, right? This m0 by t1 term. And the only way to do that in sort of a, a linear algebra, sort of matrix uh, aware way, is to add on some vector on the end, okay? I have to add on this m0 over t1 term, but specifically just to the z component. It doesn't go on x, it doesn't go on y, it just goes on z. So this is a you know, a linear algebra way of expressing the same set of differential equations. This is a little bit unsatisfying and it's a little bit tricky. Um, and the problem is that you have uh, this differential equation but it's inhomogeneous with this sort of beta term on the end that has to account for this uh, um, uh, relaxation term there. And in fact, there's a way around this sort of problem. The problem being that if I want to sort of code this up or code up solutions to this differential equation, it just becomes cumbersome. Uh, and the trick around that is what we call homogeneous coordinates. And you may or may not have seen this before, uh, but it really ends up being mathematically convenient, really useful for this class. So homogeneous coordinates, so-called homogeneous coordinates, allow us to transform an affine nonlinear equation in 3D, that's what that previous slide was sort of showing, to a linear equation in 4D. And linear equations are a lot easier for us to deal with from a programming perspective and uh, uh, for several other reasons as well. And so what I'll show you in just a second is the affine sort of form of these equations was some differential equation with this inhomogeneous, this non-zero term on the end here. We can reformulate it in this uh, way here uh, where H is just indicating that we're in the so-called homogeneous coordinate frame now. And now everything is just a matrix operator, okay? And that's a really nice thing in MATLAB because that means if I want to act on my bulk magnetization to tell me what happens to the rate of its change, I can just multiply it by some matrix. And I don't have to do a lot of bookkeeping. It ends up 
maybe you have to trust me, but it ends up being a lot easier for, for me and for you guys. So, uh, and, and the point is now we can use the machinery of linear algebra, which is to say a language like MATLAB, for writing out the block equations and what happens to the bulk magnetization. Um, and it's actually a really simple thing to do. And so if we think in sort of just conventional coordinates, say Cartesian coordinates, we just have three components to our magnetization. In homogeneous coordinates, we just have to tack on a one at the end here. It becomes a placeholder of sorts. You'll see why this is convenient in just a second. Uh, in so-called Cartesian coordinates, we could have a matrix operator. This matrix operator could multiply on some vector and give us a new vector. It could rotate that vector, which is a lot of what MR does, but it could stretch that vector or do other things to that vector. In homogeneous coordinates, we can do the same thing, but we can usefully tap on here what, what appears like a translation. So that last term of the uh, block equations, uh, that returned equilibrium term, the m naught over T1 term, is effectively like a translation of our bulk magnetization. And so we can take this uh, sort of three by three form and re-express it as a four by four, uh, in a four by four formulation. What does that mean? Whoops, that was fast. Um, so now, uh, uh, oh, that's strange. Yeah, there's some, something not quite right on that slide. Uh, one sec, one sec. Let's see, let's take a look at this slide. That's where it's going. Ah. Yeah, funny. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is a this is a big mistake. Uh, this term shouldn't be here, uh, and in fact, it probably belongs over here. This m. I'm going to have to make a correction on this slide. This m not by t1 term. I think fills in for this zero that's over here. Uh, is that going to work out? So my mz, I'm going to pick up the mz and then, yep. Uh, not sure what happened. So you should cross out this term. And this m naught by t1 should be sitting where this zero vector or the zero element is. That's a. Uh, atrocious copy-paste LaTeX layout mistake. So uh, what you should have been able to see is that I could write out a four by four expression that if I just carry out the array multiplication would give me the same system of equations up here but in a sort of compact form that's just uh, in this so-called homogeneous coordinate form. Now, why is that all going to be useful? Well, it's going to be useful in a second because I, don't, I won't have terms like this on the end. I shouldn't have had this term, but I won't be adding on terms at the end. I can just keep doing matrix multiplication. And that's a really nice and easy thing to do uh, in a, in a matrix-aware language like MATLAB and to be able to loop through structures like that. I can just keep operating on my bulk magnetization and updating, say, the relaxation that should be happening to that system, for example. The examples, I hope, will, will make it even more clear. Okay. So what are the advantages, disadvantages of, of doing things this way? Well, when we, go, when we think about the, the, the advantages of, of this, one advantage of this approach is that you have, uh, you'll have a really nice one-to-one -one correlation with the pulse sequence diagram. You can actually assign operators to the RF pulse, and you can assign an operator to a gradient, and you can assign an operator to a period of free precession. So it'll have this nice correspondence with the pulse sequence diagram it, itself. You'll see in a second, I hope you'll agree, it's simple to implement in MATLAB. There's some code already available on the website. You should definitely borrow from that uh, for both understanding this and also getting started with your homework assignment. I also like it because it's not ad hoc, meaning I, it may be a little bit cumbersome. We'll talk about that in a second, but it's not ad hoc. It's a very, uh, it's a very um, uh, sort of rule-based way of, of describing what happens to the bulk magnetization. Um, and it can provide us some understanding in really complex systems. So we've been working through analytic solutions, ones that we can work out on the board. Small changes to the initial conditions, small changes to the envelope function can make it very complicated to understand what's happening to the bulk magnetization. But in this framework that I'm presenting, there's a, it gives you some traction in a, in a way to get at it. Uh, the downside is that I would say it sort of can mask some understanding in simple systems. Why do we work through the examples I've worked through so far? Well, the, I would say the main reason we work through them is so that we can get some mathematical insight. So these sort of 
unusual uh, uh, situations that have analytic solutions, we can write an answer and say, oh, look, it's a sine term. Oh, look, it's a cosine term. And now I understand it's going, you know, it's rotating around or it's precessing. But that's not always going to be the simple case. Um, so when you go through a simulation framework, you can lose some understanding because uh, you, don't get, you don't get the answer, right? You don't get the analytic solution at the end. You just get data. You get an array of com you know, bulk magnetization components or something like that. Uh, very cumbersome to get it down to algebraic expression. So I like seeing you know, closed form solutions that are sines and cosines and exponentials. But through simulation, you sort of lose that. So that, that sort of insight is sometimes lost, but it allows you to operate and work on much more complicated systems. Uh, inherently, it's going to be discrete, meaning we're going to pick little delta time steps. We're going to simulate for you know, microseconds or nanoseconds or tens of microseconds, and we'll have these little delta steps to help us understand what's going on. Uh, and of course, perfect simulations are hard. There's lots of things that you have to be uh, careful about. And uh, this is more of a subtlety even, but it's really good for understanding image preparation, like ways that we manipulate the magnetization before doing the imaging experiment. If you actually want to do, sim if you actually want to simulate the actual imaging experiment itself, that can be very involved because, as we'll see when we start talking more about imaging, there's a lot of things happening during the imaging procedure itself. Not that we can't do it; it's just uh, more complicated. Okay, so let's see if we can start talking about some some simple examples so you can understand why I why I like this approach. Oops. Okay. So we saw this early on uh, where we could take the, uh, the, this is going to be just uh, for the B0 field. So what happens to the bulk magnetization as a function of time in the presence of a B0 field? So this is free precession described in this case in the laboratory frame. So we have some initial state to our, our magnetization. It doesn't matter what it is. You could put in numbers for these or you could just leave these as variables. And we worked out this solution when we worked through the equation of motion and we saw that there were these sines and cosine terms that depended on things like gamma B0, the precessional frequency. And that's where we drew out the Larmor relationship from. And then I said, well, that's just a rotation operator. So a shorthand form of expressing this in a sort of a matrix aware way would be just that you have a rotation operator uh, that takes as input something like gamma B0 and T, telling you what's the, the rate or the amount of precession that you have. And that has to act on some initial condition vector. And as I update my time step here, I can get uh, sort of new states of my bulk magnetization. I can just work my way through what's happening to my bulk magnetization. Okay? So how do I... Sorry, this keeps skipping. Um, sorry. One more time. Okay, so now if I want to do this in the homogeneous coordinate expression way, uh, you don't have to actually do it this way. The reason you have to use homogeneous coordinates is when you get to relaxation. Relaxation kind of requires that we use the homogeneous coordinates uh, as, a, as a mathematically convenient thing. Uh, here it's not that hard. We just have to append on some zeros and a column here with a one in the bottom right corner. And then if I want to write this out in a matrix aware uh, way, I just have to write out this four by four matrix operator. That's going to operate on the components of my transverse magnetization and give me the new components of my transverse magnetization. When I write things like uh, zero plus and zero minus, uh, same thing that they do in the book, this just means this is MX sort of right before something's happening, right? Immediately before, or sorry, that's backwards, right? This should be, yeah, this should be immediate. This, these should be minuses. Sorry, guys. Uh, those should be minuses, meaning it's the magnetization immediately before some operator or some event. The event is going to be the processional operator that's in the middle here, and that's going to give me a state of the magnetization immediately after uh, that event, if you will. And so these should all be pluses as well. Okay. Sorry for that. Okay. We'll code that up in just a second. I'll show you what that looks like. RF pulse operators, same idea. We saw today sort of a matrix expression for the RF pulse operator when we include alpha and theta. We know what the phase is. We know what the flip angle is. How do we do something with that? Well, same way. We can augment this, so to speak, into homogeneous coordinates. So it just has this 4 by 4 array. And that becomes something that can easily operate on that bulk magnetization vector uh, as shown here. So the bulk magnetization immediately before some event is operated on by some RF 
pulse operator in this, in this sense and gives us the bulk magnetization immediately after some event. Um, and we know what that operator looks like. It's just a sort of clumsy array of sines and cosines and alphas and thetas. Where this really uh, comes into having value, and I said this a second ago, is when it comes to relaxation. If we want to describe what's happening to the, uh, the bulk magnetization during relaxation, it just gets a little bit tricky from a coding perspective if you're always adding on uh, this returned equilibrium term. So this is the sort of conventional way that you might write it out. We can also write it out this way here, and this is the correction I made a second ago, or the, at least the first correction. Uh, that I made a second ago, where we write this out, and this is in, in a four by four sense, right? So there's a bunch of zeros in here. But now we can multiply out, uh, say, the MX component here. And we would say I have uh, MX immediately before all of this, uh, the event that I'm trying to describe, some period of relaxation by some time T. And that's going to give me my MX component immediately after this duration of relaxation. We'll have to pick T. T is like some, some time step that you care about or some duration or interval that you care about. And if I work through the matrix multiplication, it looks the same for my MY term, but I end up with two terms that come out here for my, uh, related to my MZ magnetization, if you will, including this return to equilibrium term, which is pulled in finally through this extension into the homogeneous coordinate frame. So again, what's the point? Well, the point is I can just write this up as a matrix operator in MATLAB, and then I can set up looping structures to take account of you know, incremental uh, bits of relaxation. And then what gets to be more and more interesting is I can say, well, maybe I do care about uh, not just forced precession and not just free precession, but I care about forced precession with relaxation. And that's, kind of, that's complicated to write out by hand, but to simulate it, it's actually not that hard. Uh, and so this is, uh, uh, this is that relaxation operator sort of written in a shorthand form. You'll see this in the literature a lot. When we have these exponential terms that use T1 or use T2, sometimes I'll just write it as E1 because it can be cumbersome. I might do it some in class just to keep writing out the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, so just a maybe compact way of writing that same uh, matrix expression. Okay. So at this point, we have some introduction, uh, and I'll show you what this looks like in MATLAB uh, right after this. But the idea is we have uh, some uh, operators, right? We have a B0 operator if we want to talk about free precession in the laboratory frame. And we have some RF operator. We have one RF operator, and we have a relaxation operator. And they all act on this, the, you know, the magnetization immediately before, say, the operator itself to give us a new state of the bulk magnetization. And so now we can write this up. And maybe it sounds kind of intimidating, but it ends up being not all that bad. So this is an example. We'll work through uh, an example of how we would simulate B0 precession, right? You know what the closed form solutions look like. You know what the analytic solution looks like. But what if I said, well, B0 is not constant. B0 is a function of time. Then you'd have a harder time doing that, right? But to simulate it, not actually that hard. OK, so what would I do? So I'm going to. MATLAB, I have a bunch of comments. You can read through these in your own time. I'm going to define a function. I'm going to call it my, this is my principles and applications of MR, so my PAM function. It's B0 operator. And it takes as input gamma, B0, and DT. So if you're used to thinking about functions, I think many of you have used MATLAB before. We can define a function that will give me some delta B0 operator. It will tell me where's my bulk magnetization going to end up uh, given a particular gamma, given a particular B0, and given some small unit of time, whatever my time step is. So what does that look like? Well, I could, I, could, I could do this business here, which is just to say if I don't hand in any input arguments, let's just go ahead and define some defaults. So I give myself the, the gamma for protons. I pick that it's 1.5 T, and I choose uh, to simulate for 100 1 microsecond steps. Seems like a good start. Uh, Good MATLAB coding, I'm going to initialize my array just to have a bunch of zeros. So the output of this thing is db0. Let's go ahead and set it up to have a bunch of zeros, equivalent to the number of time steps that I want to get out of it. And then the next thing is just to define this little db, uh, my db0 operator, if you will. And this is where the homogeneous coordinate expression comes in here, right? It's just the sines and the cosines processing by uh, an angle dw, some d omega, if you will. And d omega is just 2 pi gamma b0 and then the, the delta time step that I'm talking about. Um, 
And so this will create for me an array, right? DB0 will be an array, or uh, it'll be n arrays, one for each time point. And it'll take my bulk magnetization from whatever its initial condition is. I've just talked about an operator right now. And it'll take my bulk magnetization and it will advance it according to this rotation. And the amount of, uh, that it will advance will depend on dw, which depends on things like gamma, b0, and the time step that I care about. Okay? So this is just a function. I'm going to use this function now to actually do something that looks like a simulation. I don't know why this keeps skipping so much. Sorry. One more. Okay. So let's talk about how would we simulate free precession, right? Again, I'm going to define some, uh, just some constants. What's the background field that I care about? What's my gamma that I feel uh, that, I, that I care about? And then I'm also going to give myself some initial condition. My bulk magnetization has to have, have, to have some condition. And if I want to observe uh, some transverse, uh, if I want to observe processional behavior, I, I need to have some transverse component, right? If my bulk magnetization vector just points straight up, it'll just be spinning on its axis and I won't quite see anything. So I choose to tip it over, initialize it to have an X component, no Y component, some Z component, and then the fourth component there is just handling this uh, homogeneous coordinate uh, expressions, if you will. Initialize my array, and then go ahead and say, well, my, my first element to my magnetization vector is just my initial condition. So I'm going to have a column vector for my initial condition, and I'm going to be updating the subsequent column vectors according to this rotation operator. So the next thing is just calling that function I created before. I need a db0 operator whatever my gamma is, whatever my B0 is, and whatever time step uh, I want to increment over. And this is really where you know, this ends up being, you, you could code this up another way, but this ends up being a, a relatively simple way to do it. I just have a matrix operating on my bulk magnetization. And that's going to look like my bulk magnetization is going to have some additional condition, and my matrix is going to say it needs to rotate a little bit over that way. And now I'm going to take that magnetization, I'm going to rotate it a little bit. And I'm going to take that magnetization and rotate it a little bit, just as I'm looping through this uh, for loop here. And this is going to give me every state in my bulk magnetization for all time points that I care about, right? I can plot that out, and then what I see, not surprisingly, is that my mz component, I know it's a little small, my mz component is just constant. I don't have any relaxation in this simulation, right? So whatever mz component I started with, I just keep. And my mx uh, and my my components will, of course, be oscillating like sines and cosine functions. So we could have gotten at this same solution just from the analytic expression that we had before, uh, but we would have had an impossible time doing that if, for example, B0 was a function of time. That's not the imaging systems that we use, but we can simulate that much more easily than we could possibly come up with some analytic solution. Uh, you'll need basically that previous function and something quite close to this for, I forget what it is, the, the second or third problem of your first homework assignment. Uh, I know it's a lot. I know it can be sort of dreadful to have someone talk about their code, right? Uh, but conceptually, do you understand what's, what's going on here? Do you have questions, rather, about what's going on here? Okay. Absolutely, right? And so there are office hours and there's me, right? I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to give you a warm-up before the weekend because uh, then the assignment is due sort of after the next lecture, right? Uh, there are office hours, what, tomorrow, Friday, and Monday. So keep that in mind. Vahid. Uh, what's the ratio of the time step and the um, what do you, Sorry, what do you want me to read? The numbers? Yeah, what's yep. So all the slides, I think you guys know this too, but all the slides are online, right? So there's a PDF version of what I'm showing here, unfortunately with all the mistakes included. Uh, is on the syllabus slide as well. But all that's happening here, uh, specifically, the MX component here is starting off as having a square root, of, uh, square root of 2 over 2 value, and that just comes from my initial condition, right? And then according to the processional behavior of this DB0 operator, it's going to, ro it's going to decrease in amplitude and then up and down and back and forth, right? And then the Y component is out of phase with that. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. So um, let's just look quickly uh, at the RF hard pulse operator. 
We saw this uh, as well before. I said, uh, if you want to come up with that operator, uh, you have to say first to find your flip angle alpha, right? So we know how to do that now from integrating the B1 envelope function. If it's a hard pulse, it's really easy. It's just 2 times pi times gamma times the B1 amplitude for some short period of time. What's cool about this formulation, though, is even if B1 is not a box function, we can still discretize it, right? So if it has some very unusual envelope function, you just break it up into a thousand steps, and each one of those individual steps can be just treated as, an in, as, a, as a sort of infinitesimal rect function. So a series of rect functions of slightly different amplitudes stands in for this continuous, you know, unusually shaped B1 envelope function. All this is going through is sort of the uh, taking into account the phase theta and the flip angle alpha. And we saw this uh, in, a, in the earlier slides that the ultimate B1 uh, operator was just the product of those three operators, right? The change of basis theta, the rotation by the flip angle alpha, and then changing the basis back. So this is just sort of a matrix away, aware way of just writing out that expression, borrowing exactly from what we had, you know, 20, 30 slides ago. Uh, and so there's one more slide in there. Oh, I see. Right. Sorry, the clicker's going bonkers. Uh, and so, again, the idea with what I'm at least showing here is just that you'll get these very simple rotation operators under simple circumstances. So if the phase is zero degrees and the flip angle is 90 degrees, this is the operator that acts on the bulk magnetization. We can always augment it to be in the homogeneous form and then multiply it onto uh, the, the bulk magnetization vector itself. So I didn't give you the, the tools for the relaxation operator. Uh, it's easy to, I'll, I'll put those online if they're not there already. Um, and that you won't need those for the next homework assignment. But the idea is that you'll, at, at some point, be able to string together in any kind of arbitrary order these different operators to help you simulate and describe what happens to the bulk magnetization under relatively arbitrary circumstances. And if you end up doing MR research, that's a really powerful tool. Uh, and it'll be an important thing to be able to do for the fourth homework assignment. So we're just building up to this. Okay, so that's what I have for today. Uh, but I'm happy to take questions now or hang out for a little bit. Okay. Yep. It was on the first slides. Yeah. So there's a question about sort of the TAs and the office hours and stuff. So so in my group, it's basically folks from my group that are helping TA the class. Patrick Magrath is the head TA for this next homework assignment. So he's going to be the most sort of knowledgeable about that. Send me questions. I'll respond to him as quickly as I can, or I'll shoot it to him to get a response. Uh, you want to get you want to get a head start on it. I know some of you have already, but you want to get a head start on it. And we'll get questions out of the way, and then you can do the good work. There are office hours tomorrow. There's office hours Wednesday, and then I'm here in class on Tuesday, of course. Uh, I forget the time. I think it's four to five. If you go back to the first lecture, the office hours were laid out. If you don't have slides from the first lecture, that's all online. If you haven't found all the online materials yet, ask around or come find me. <laughs> okay, thanks guys.